Dr. Pitswell, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, you alluded in your speech to the diversity of Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. um, a Christian, a Christian country, Buddhist countries, um, Muslim one of the largest Muslim countries on earth, and yeah. you know, um, an absolute monarchy, democracy, mm -hmm. all in there together. And ASEAN, sort of since its inception, has developed a very distinctive form of regionalism, yes. you know, based on um, non-intervention and, and, and informality. Um, but do you see that model changing at all as Southeast Asia integrates economically? Well, I think there has already been signs of change. Um, you're talking about principle of non-interference. Mm. It's no longer absolute. Back in 1967, maybe. But now you see people are beginning to realize that with integration, you are exposed to each other's problems. So your problems today could be mine tomorrow. So, for example, in the case of Myanmar, when uh, there was a lot of violence and misunderstanding and conflicts inside, all of us were having uh, a tremendous concern. So we have devised what we call a, a constructive engagement uh, modality and that is to engage with Myanmar to, to, to deliver the international community's concern and uh, you know, along the way goodwill that Myanmar would, would transform itself and uh, but uh, absolute non-interference is no longer possible in a world of integration in, in the way in which Southeast Asia is evolving and East Asia is evolving for that matter we have established something called the Common Fund to defend ourselves in time of economic hardship. Now, in 1997, we were exposed. You know, some of our currencies were attacked, and some of them went down, and that precipitated the crisis, first Asian financial crisis. Now, since then, 13 of us, 10 ASEAN plus 3, China, Japan, Korea, have created a fund. We call it the Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization. Uh, Chiang Mai, after the city of Chiang Mai, where the governors of central banks of all of us and deputy ministers of finance came and decided to set up this fund. Now, this fund has led to an office to monitor each other's macroeconomic performances. Now, what is more intrusive than providing an opportunity for a central office looking into the way in which you run your economies. But we have gone that far. So, as I said, now it's 240 billion US dollars, 13 countries with an office in Singapore with the, uh, with the charge of monitoring how each member state is doing. What is your uh, trade deficit? What is your current account deficit look like? What does your inflationary rate look like? If you go down, you will affect me. So this is the kind of thing that is evolving. Yes, there is a change, there is a transformation in the form of, in the way we look at non-interference. And it's often been argued by advocates of economic integration that with development, with economic development comes democracy. Um, Southeast Asia seems to be, in some senses, an exception in the sense that democracy hasn't caught on and thrived uh, like many expected it would. Imagine in 1967, all of us were authoritarian, centralized. Indonesia, Thailand. Malaysia has been a very strong one-party system all along. Singapore, one-party system all along. Um, the Philippines went into a dictatorship for a while. but. We are now emerging out and uh, opening up. I think the growth of the economies, all economies, have led to a wider space for the media, free media, not absolutely free media, but you know, more vocal, more critical, and the space for the civil society, the space for the private sector themselves. Um, it's 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 no longer absolute as before. So, actually, the 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 purpose of ASEAN has been dual purpose. One is, of course, economic prosperity, common economic prosperity, 
creating economic community. But the other one is gradually opening up the societies. And that's where we are now. I mean, Myanmar for a long, long time has been under the military. But, you know, with the dynamics, the interaction, the nudging and the, and the, the plodding, the prodding, uh, Myanmar is now opening up. Reconciliation is going on at two levels within the body politic, between the opposition and the military, but also within and among the ethnic groups. Now, other countries are going, you can't say that Indonesia has gone, has not gone through a transformation. The Philippines has come back from authoritarian regime. Thailand is very noisy, but uh, it's a functioning democracy. It could be more effective, yes, but it is a very free and open too free and too open, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Can you see then, as uh, the Southeast Asian countries become ever more economically integrated, that that process will speed up, this gradual change will accelerate? I think so. I think economic prosperity will lead to the need for transparency, participation, ownership, accountability, uh, gradually, uh, and the social networking, the new communication technology, all these things, education, all these things are going to lead to a sense of uh, belonging, participation, and ownership, and will demand accountability, will demand transparency. So all these uh, sis political systems are responding to the demand and the pressure of their of their citizens, not at the same speed, not reaching you know at the same equal uh, level of democratic development, but certainly moving in the same direction. One of the key themes of uh, the speech that you gave this afternoon was the the, the trading relationship between the West mm -hmm. and the Southeast Asian nations, and previously the Western countries have often been seen as the senior partner in that relationship. Mm. But now that the balance is changing, mm. uh, do you see a more equal relationship between Well, the I West think so. East? I think the West is um, looking at East Asia more as opportunities to go and invest. In fact, the highest source of, in of foreign direct investment for ASEAN has come from Europe for many, many years. And then third largest trading partner continues to be so and uh, more and more uh, goods and services are flowing this way and yours are being exported the other way, uh, more bargaining power on the other side because of the size of the market, because of the rising middle class, because of expanding and, high and, and rising uh, purchasing power. Uh, all these things are contributing to the enhancement of the of the bargaining power of those of those economies, and collectively, they have more. And I think to the to the mutual benefit of, of each other, and uh, they are making stronger representation on pr protectionism measures that you may have on health ground, on other um, on other ground. But uh, yes, they are making more and more. Uh, demand and pressure and equally I mean um, reciprocally Europe is listening to them more because Europe want to sell Europe want to invest Europe want to tourists to come Europe want students to come here too at the at the University of Warwick so as a final question mm. uh, with the rise of, 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 of these the rise of the Southeast Asian nation China uh, and India as well. You've made the case that, that, that it's a positive change yes. that we'll see more cooperation, mm. um, trade boundaries mm. um, brought down. Do you see that there could be a possibility for any conflict or increased tensions between the West and the East in the coming years? I'm more worried about the, the East and the East <laughs> than the West and the East. <laughs> there are enough of the fault lines in our region and uh, you know 
Western external powers are interested in the affairs of the region, as I said, because the region has become more important. Anything happening, any derailment occurs on the growth path of East Asia, of Southeast Asia, it will affect Europe, it will affect uh, the US, North America. Uh, but there are enough issues among ourselves <laughs> that would keep us awake uh, at night. Uh, what we're expecting is external powers can help, can make a contribution, can uh, certainly um, uh, restrain any trend toward, any evolution toward open conflicts among us and between us. That's one. And uh, we need to build our own institutions. We are working on that. We need to build our own systems and processes that would help consolidate all these uh, divergent uh, cultures, norms, and governance levels of economic development to a body of rule and regulations within a form. And right now we have the ASEAN regional form that would lead to more mutual understanding, trust, transparency, to avoid an occasion or a situation of misunderstanding, of misreading, of miscalculation that could lead to uh, an open conflict. And so all of us are in it together. Europe, North America are also very important for stability and security in our part of the world, for our common interest in economic prosperity. Dr. Pitzwan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.